Dr. Ken Spencer co-founded Creo Products in 1983, which subsequently grew to be Brit British Columbia's largest technology company with over 4,000 employees in BC, the US, Europe, and Israel. He retired as CEO in 1995, but remained active on its board until its acquisition by Kodak for over $1 billion in 2000. For the past 15 years, he served as investor, co-founder, chair, and director of numerous BC-based technology companies, not-for-profits, and educational institutions, including Redland Technologies, BCIT, UBC's Electrical and Computer Engineering Advisory Committee, and UBC's University Liaison Office. Ken has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Cecil Green Award for Technology, Entrepreneurship from the Science Council of BC, the UBC Engineering Community Service Award, and was inducted into the Business Laureates of BC Hall of Fame in 2010. He is also an alumnus of SFU, which is one of the reasons he has split loyalties between UBC and SFU. He got his engineering there, but his MBA from us. Received his MBA from the, his executive MBA from the Faculty of Business Administration in 1981, and in 1991, won SFU's Outstanding Alumni Award for Professional Achievement. As, as I mentioned earlier, he's continued his affiliation with SFU through the Technology Entrepreneurship at SFU program and the Ken Spencer Student Incubator. We're extremely grateful to him for his continued support in the teaching and nurturing of technology entrepreneurship at SFU. And just while I'm here, I'd just like to mention that uh, Ken and his wife, Judy Gale, also give back uh, in many ways to the community. Uh, they're prime examples of philanthropic leadership in our community. They give with purpose, focusing on education, vulnerable children, and youth facing barriers, business mentorship, and the environment. Over their 25-year uh, involvement with Science World, they've personally contributed in excess of a million five dollars to turn kids on to science. So please join me in, th in welcoming Dr. Ken Spencer. Lori <laughs> and Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you to have a fireside chat. So uh, they have got a, they've been t talking with each other. They haven't had too many drinks tonight, so it should be lots of fun. <clears throat> Is my mic on? Okay, great. Um, you know, my, my relationship with Ken started in 1997. Ken became a, an investor and a board member in the company, my first company called Datum Telegraphic, and was an integral part of our successful uh, run of the business and ultimate sale of the company. Um, and Ken has been a, a mentor and good friend since that time. We've actually even traveled quite extensively together. We've gone from one end of the earth, earth to the other. We w went to Antarctica together, and then we went to the um, 80 degrees north latitude, so just, just below the North Pole together. And we've done the Great Bear Rainforest in a few times, so we've done a few travels and things like that, which has been very pleasant. Um, but, uh, you know, Ken, is, Ken as a board member, um, I would first to say he was a very demanding board member. He was someone who, who demanded excellence, hard work, and success. And, uh, you know, um, that's really very much part of how he's driven in everything. He, he's, he's ultimately, you're there to have a purpose, and you're there to work hard, and you're there to be measurable and have success. And that was a, a big part of what help grow us and develop us is understanding that. As you probably know, Ken, is, he was the, the, the co-founder and the CEO of Creo for its first 11 years. And uh, subsequently, the company was in business for a little over 20 years. He, he maintained a, a board seat through its, uh, its final exit and a sale of uh, over a billion dollars. But during that time, Creo grew to a company that had over a billion dollars, or uh, sorry, just short of a billion dollars in annual sales. So this was not only did it have a tremendous market capitalization, um, but it, it, it had a tremendous amount of revenues. And a lot of things have happened over those 20 years, and he, you know, he can share a lot of those experiences, the good and the bad. And as you know, he's a, you know, currently a very active philanthropist here in, the, here in Vancouver and overseas with uh, vulnerable children. So Ken, I guess the question is, you know, you started out, uh, or not started out, but you were an executive at both McDonald Etweiler and Glen Eyre, which were both marquee companies in, in the lower mainland. Uh, but ultimately left both those organizations, you know, maybe for dubious reasons, but, uh, um, and, and you, with, with a passion to, to start your own business. So what was, what was the driving force to wanting to start a business? This is back in 82, 83. Uh, he said dubious reasons. That's because I got fired both times. Uh, and, um, but right from when I was working as a student, 
I kept thinking that all these ideas of how to manage people and nobody else was going to let me try it out on their company so I had to start a company and then part of that process was why I got my MBA I thought having had a PhD I kind of wanted an academic framework to kind of hang these ideas on and I discovered through taking my MBA that a lot of my ideas weren't original but nobody was practicing them you know and a lot of people did work in the 50s and so on about how to manage people, but nobody did it. Interesting. So uh, I co-founded the company with Dan Galbert, who we'd worked together at MDA. Uh, when, um, when I left MDA, he, he came and said, you're the only manager I ever had that enhanced my performance rather than retarded it, and someday <laughs> we'll start a company. So I said, okay, let's start a company. He said, oh, not now. He just had this young kid. He said, you know, we can start a company and I'll go, he had a lab in his basement. I'll go into my basement, I'll come up five years later with a great product, my wife will be gone, my kids will be gone. So we gotta wait a while, so I went sailing for a year and then I came back and said, how about now? And he said, no, <laughs> not ready yet. And then uh, I went to Glen Air, so I, the Glen Air Electronics, which doesn't exist anymore, and I worked there a year and a half and left there and um, said, how about now? He said, no, no, not yet. So I had decided to start a company without him and I was getting it together and three months later he knocked on my door. We were kind of neighbors, lived a few blocks away. He said, now's the time. I said, what happened? He said, oh, he says, I developed these great products and marketing and management just screw them up. We've got to start our own company. So we did. And the reason it's called Creo, which is Latin, for I create, because we didn't have a clue what we were going to do. We didn't have a product in mind, nothing in mind. We were just going to start a company. Turns out in Spanish it means I believe, so it was even better <laughs> <laughs> as well. So, well, it's interesting, Ken, because you know a lot of companies they, you know, they have this laser focus and they say this is the product we're going after, this is the market we're going after, and they don't deviate from that and they don't take external sources to make any changes. Um, and your company, Creo, you started out doing, you know, optical disk drive recording systems, but ultimately, the company sold and became successful because in the printer prepress. So, what was the what was the reasoning to, you know, start down one path? And at what point did you get to think, thinking maybe this isn't the path that's going to give us the, the value we want, and we're going to have to go somewhere else? I think that's true of all the startups. They rarely succeed on the product they started on. I don't I didn't even date them. Yeah. No, exactly, but it, it's... Uh, so, yeah, so we, at the time, you have to go back to the uh, late 80s. At the time, uh, data, mass data was stored on magnetic tapes, or real tape. I hold, uh, oops, I've forgotten my numbers. 5,000 5, megabytes. And, uh, and that was kind of the limit. So we started developing an optical tape recorder, which would store a terabyte. And it was a difficult project because there was no way to write on tape, there was no way to read the tape, and there was no tape. <laughs> <laughs> so it took five years, and we developed an optical tape recorder, and, um, and we, f we didn't have any investment. We financed the company by do having one team doing, quote, consulting work. It was building specialized machines for, for another company and the, funding the other team to develop the optical tape recorder and we got it to market and it worked and it was a success you know technically but the market wasn't nearly as big as uh, we needed to satisfy our ego expectations so we had to do something else so then we hired a third founder but he wasn't the founder by then but a uh, third guy and his job was to find market for our technology and that's when we got in the prepress business because we could write stuff really small and effectively. So, and the um, the, the the flagship product in Creo was a computer to plate. So when we entered the business, the offset printing, you made a piece of film, you put it on a plate, and you process. Well, actually, when we entered, you made it on several pieces of film and you laid it on a table and you put it together with masking tape, for some reason called stripping, 
and then you put that film on a plate, you put the plate through a process, you took the plate, mounted on the press. And what we did, uh, were the first to do, although others were working on it, was to put it directly, uh, use a laser to write directly on the plate and eliminate all the film and in large formats. And that leads to a whole bunch of things I won't get into in workflow and, and so on. It just changed the printing industry. The, the plate, the pre-press room used to be in another building and you had to freeze it three days. I don't know why you made the plate three days ahead of the press run. And R.R. Donnelly, the company that really got us going, um, they put the plate makers right beside the press. And, you know, economics are sometimes weird. The guys that printed, I hope you guys remember Yellow Pages. <laughs> The guys that printed the yellow pages said every day they could add or shorten the cutoff date added a million dollars to his bottom line. I said, yellow pages? <laughs> but anyway, they won't get into that. Anyway, so it changed all the workflow. So eventually, once you got rid of the film, then you had to have a way to proof. So then we made proofers and then we made software. We had 400 software people doing workflow software and so on and so forth. And, and the numbers get big, you know, you think about it. Um, when you're doing a billion dollars a year, you got to book five million dollars a day. <laughs> and we spent 200 million a year in R&D. And uh, it's over a million dollars a working day. So, What I find interesting, like there's a, a, a fellow who's also been another mentor of mine, and Ken knows very well, a guy named Haig Ferris. And Haig's a legend in the, in the tech community here. And he, he popped, he's, he's got, he, He's coined a lot of phrases, but one of which is no company ever starts out, or no ever company ever succeeds with the vision that it started out on. It kind of meanders at ways to the finish. And, you know, certainly I, the first company, our company, we changed vision, but part of that was because our vision was failed. We couldn't, we couldn't execute in that. We didn't actually generate revenues and we had to make a, a change. I, I think what's interesting about Creo is their, their first product, this optical drive, actually was generating revenues. So they were abandoning a business. Now, maybe we're not a business as to say to feed his ego and his, what he wants to do, but it still was a, a successful business in, in all intents and purposes. We eventually sold it. Yeah, yeah but it, the, the fact is that to abandon a business there and say, hey, look, we can do something more, that to me takes a lot more, uh, you know, a little, little bit more initiative. It's more of a gamble because you're giving up something which could go further. Um, what's interesting is that uh, like the company was in, Creo was around for a little over 20 years and Ken was the CEO for the first 11 years, but the, the last 10 years, it was run by a fellow named Amos Michelson. And, you know, Amos was brought in as a kind of a sub-partner at one point and as a vice president. But what's interesting is that Ken, you know, kind of put his ego aside. And I know as being a CEO, you, you know, you have egos and you, you want that title. But, you know, it's interesting, Ken, what was the driving force to say, I'm going to step down as being the CEO and going to elevate somebody who's at a vice president level and say, hey, look at Amos, you're going to be now be the CEO and I'm going to take a, a bit of a backseat. What was that process like? Backseat, I took off. Okay, you took off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a t you know, I turned 51 and I had a good friend die who had spent all his life, he was a dairy farmer, working seven days a week and he had just decided to sell the farm and spend his money and he died. So this gets you thinking. And I read a book saying if work's so important, you can always go back to it. But, you know, more germane to this conversation, you know, Amos had a lot more experience. I had worked at MDA most of the time, and we sold the governments. And I never really understood marketing, I've discovered. And Amos really understood marketing. So, and I just figured out, yeah, I'd make more money. I'll end up with more money if Amos becomes a CEO, and I'll have a better time while he does the hard work. <laughs> so, uh, so we made the change, and then uh, I didn't think CEO should, old CEO should stick around. But so we went. Try, my wife and my son and I went around the world with our bicycles for a year, and I put. I had a right to have a board seat um, by you know shareholders' agreement because of my large shareholding, and. Um, and when I came back, I thought I shouldn't go on the board, but he wanted me on the board, so I went back on the board. And that, that's one, one thing, everybody goes out and raises money. Dan and I ran the company for five years without raising any money, so subsequently we owned a heck of a lot more of it than most founders. 
And then just an interesting point, when, uh, when I first met Haig, or sorry, Ken, Haig introduced me to Ken uh, back in 97, and Haig was an initial investor, and we wanted to get Ken involved. One of the things that was a parallel was because our business, we started out as a, a consulting company, as much like Creo did. And so we bootstrapped our business by doing consulting services, you know, not saying it was a similar, but paralleling along that line. And there's a value in that. I mean, I found that, you know, when I started out a business, I, I learned on someone else was paying me to learn and build and grow as an experience. Plus, I didn't have to dilute myself by raising a lot of capital, prove the business up, and then take a lot of those proceeds. And then ultimately, we did raise some capital, but it was to take a lot of those proceeds and fund them into development. The good news about that, not only do you grow and learn from that, but you don't suffer the dilution level. So in the case, case of Creo, they didn't suffer that same dilution, so it was a positive. Now, you touched on the marketing, but what would you say with some of the, you know, the if you could have had a redo on some of the things you did at Creo, which, what would you have done differently earlier on? Like, what were some of your, your, your foibles? What we should have done differently with the optical tape recorders understood the market much better. It was a technology play. It was something nobody else had done and nobody else could do, but people didn't want to put that much data. And, then, and one of the advantages of optical tape was it would last 100 years, so it was archival. But what we figured out, what one customer, potential customer or customer told us, you know, the tape will last 100 years, but the machines won't be around 100 years to read it, so that doesn't work. Um, so anyways, I think where we didn't spend enough time was understanding true marketing. I don't mean sales. We know how to sell. Uh, true marketing, understanding the product and the customer's needs better. Um, that's about it. I mean, we always had a million dollars in the bank from after the first year, so we never had those late night, or we had lots of late nights, never had stayed awake at night wondering where the payroll was coming from and so on. You know, one of the things I know, you know, it's, it's interesting when you talk about people at Creo, and you, know, you guys have mentioned it, Dan and you know, Ken and Amos, you, they talk about the Creo culture. Um, you know, and you talked about running management, doing it differently. How would you define, you know, I guess it's a two-part question, but how would you define the Creo culture? Um, and, and what did you do differently in a management style at Creo that wasn't being done at places like McDonald Detweiler or Glen Eyre or other businesses? Well, yeah, the, the Creo culture, the, the, the word to capture is empowerment. Um, and so everybody was empowered, everybody in the company, anybody in the company, could write a purchase order for any amount of money without checking with anybody else. So that's real empowerment. Now there's a lot of stuff goes with that. We've got to teach people how to calculate. We use payback. I know from my MBA you're supposed to use net present value, but that was too complicated, so we use payback. <laughs> um, so you have to, you know, and I think the money, is, you know, so you're, you're going to waste a little money doing that. But I think the money waste, you know, people will make mistakes, but the money wasted was minuscule compared to a couple of things. You eliminate middle management checking things. And people are so motivated when you trust them. Like, they worked 12, 14 hour days. They were so committed. And two people came up tonight and said they had friends that worked at Creo. And, and, and I hear this a lot. You know, it was the best company I ever worked for. And that's just because we let them do it. And uh, it was really empowerment. Um, what was the second part? Well, I was kind of wondering where, where, where some of the issues that, we, that you learned at McDonald Detweiler or Glen Eyre, that were the failings that you, 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 you wanted to... Yeah, well, I, they were hierarchical companies. And I mean, maybe not picking on them. After I retired, quote, retired, a guy uh, who ran Science Council took over Saskatchewan Research Council. And... Uh, no, I got a better story. Okay, there's another company. <laughs> there's another company my son worked for as a co-op student, an SFU engineering co-op student. And he went there, and he's going to be there four months, and they give him a project, and he needs to spend $800 to get the stuff to do the project. And uh, the CEO had to sign every purchase order, and he was away. So Daryl sat around for a month. They paid him $4,000. You know, to wait for the CEO to get around to signing an $800 purchase order. So, so it's a total different mindset. The guy, the Saskatchewan Research, he wanted me to come in and look at their operations. And so I went there and um, I walked around. I found that nine people had to sign 
a purchase requisition before it could get to purchasing to get a purchase order. And I went to each of the nine and I said, well, what value do you add? A lot of silence, <laughs> but um, probably not too popular there. <laughs> but anyways, it's, it's all about, yeah, empowerment. I could, you know, I have lectures on empowerment, but. Yeah, no, it reminds me of this, you know, just a little while ago, we sold a business, uh, um, partner PD, we sold it back in, in July of last year. It was interesting, you know, we, we had the money from the Canadian government, and it took us, uh, we had all the reps and warranties signed from every company releasing us of the IP, et cetera, except for the Canadian government. And, and it, we had to pay them a certain amount of money, but it took me six weeks to get their damn signatures, and I told, it was told it needed to be signed by the president of I IRAP, who happened to be on holidays. And, and just you wonder why the, you know, the bureaucracy of the government, why it's, uh, it's so in, ineffectual. So it was nice to see those things be streamlined. It's funny because, oh, sorry. You're, oh. Well, I forgot the other half of the purchasing. So anybody could sign a purchase order, but they had to answer three questions just to themselves. You know, did it have payback within two years? Uh, they had to consult by the people affected by the decision. So if you're buying something other people are going to use, you had to get buy-in from them. And thirdly, if I own this company 100%, would I still spend this money? So, and we taught economics, you know, we taught lots of stuff, Lunar lectures every week. Yeah. Well, that's what's interesting. I know that, uh, you know, you know, Amos actually sent me, uh, last year I asked him for the pre economics presentations this was with the CEO at the end, a Creo, and they actually have a presentation which they taught to all of their staff on economics, so everyone understood it. So it didn't matter if you, you came from an engineering background, they wanted you to understand the value of the finance and the value of, you know, if you make a justification, what's your cost justification for, for making this investment? Um, but it's... It and the difference between an expense and a capital expense. And accounting's really easy, you know, because it's, all, it's only plus and minuses. Sometimes they multiply, never take a first derivative. <laughs> to learn accounting, you just have to learn the language. There's a language, credit, they don't say plus minus, they say credit debit, you know, and they have operating and capital and liabilities and assets. Well, once you learn the language, I could teach accounting to anybody in two hours. <laughs> I mean, not bookkeeping, but so you could read, it, so you could read financial statements. Yeah, and I can't. I, teach them the language. I can't, you know, encourage you more to not the, the value of understanding the, of the businesses and things like that. Like the difference between an entrepreneur and an employee is that, you know, the employee looks forward to payday and, you know, the entrepreneur hates payday because you're trying to manage, <laughs> the, you know, manage your finances and things like that. But if you can't manage finances and you, you don't understand that and if you don't understand what your, your margin is, then you don't have any way of determining whether or not, I'm working with a company right now and they, you know, they've got different channels in market and they've got a product which is going out which is, you know, 15 point margin, gross margin to certain channels. It just doesn't make sense. You've got to find ways to move it to higher margin business. Either that or you've got to lower your bomb costs. But, you know, you, you have to understand that. If you don't understand your margin business, you can't successfully price anything. There's just no way you can successfully price without understanding. So, you know, um, do, even if you go in the engineering discipline, make sure you get some um, experience in, in, in accounting, economics, or understanding the, yeah. the, the broader scope. And we gave our results to everybody. The quarterly results went to all the employees, because it's, it's like, I, my analogy is football. Can you imagine playing football and not knowing how score is kept? You know, so you go out there for a quarter, and you come back, and the coach says, oh, we're doing okay, I've got to do a little better. And then at halftime, says, oh, well, we're a bit behind. But no numbers. <laughs> And that's how people run their companies, no numbers to the employees. So how do they know if they don't know how the score is kept and then what the score is, how can you expect them to make good decisions? Now, Ken, you, you started your business, I mean, I'm not trying to, how old you were at the time, but you, you were certainly, okay, 40 years old. So I knew I was going to say, you certainly were into your late 30s when you, you started it. Um, you know, you've got an audience here of you know, people who are younger. What do you think of the, the the pros and cons of, of, of starting a business younger versus starting a business when you've got some experience? Well, that's a good, you know, I, I think you should go to school, you should work in a big company for a couple of years at least to figure out how they do things, what systems they use. But, and I used to preach that, but it's obviously not essential. When you look at Google and Facebook and so on, Microsoft, none of them did it that way and they grew much bigger than Creo, so. But I was really glad that I'd learned on other people's money. <laughs> now, Ken, you, 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 you invest in companies. I mean, you were an investor in, in 
my business, um, when you did invest, I know you're not doing it much right now, but when you did invest in companies, some of them have been successful, some haven't, but you know, what would you say, what were you looking for, or what do you think you should look for? Like, you know, what are the, what are the attributes that you see in someone that says, hey, this, you know, the business or the person that you think this is something I want to back financially? The people. Because if they get it wrong, they'll fix it. Laurie claims, I don't think it's true, Laurie claims when he was doing his presentation on datum that I fell asleep. <laughs> Sat there like this. <laughs> I listen better with my eyes closed. <laughs> and, the, and then it was at the end they said, well, I really don't understand it, but, you know, I'll, they didn't need money, but, so I'll, I'll join your board, but I wouldn't join the board unless I could make an investment. So. But what, in, in other businesses, what, what is it that you look for? What, you know, right people. Yeah, but do you, do you care about the market? Do you care about their business? I care that they understand the market. I don't have to understand it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, my, my contention is that uh, the, ma the most important thing when you look at business is, and, and I, I probably invested in about, probably about a dozen companies here in town, is the market is, is, is the thing that I, you know, I, outside the people, I'm not disputing that fact. The market's so important because you can, if you're in a good market, you have great upside and opportunity. If, you can, if you're in a failed market or, or a market that has a you know, headroom, you can't get beyond that, then, you're, then you, no matter how much you do well, you, you can't get beyond that, that one successful level. I mean, this a hag who he's referred to once said, um, you know, the one thing about Ken is he hires good people, implying I didn't do anything else. And, and maybe he was right, but I was never, you know, one of the things is I always tried to hire people smarter than me. Then I didn't have to work so hard. <laughs> but you, interesting, at Creo, you had a situation where you didn't allow an, a manager to hire an employee without it going through up the scale. You, you, were, you and Dan and Amos were involved with hiring people, were you not? Oh, yeah, we hired a lot of people. But, no, but what was the, your reasoning was you, you wanted to ensure that they would hire someone smarter than them? Oh, yeah. Well, A's hire A's and B's hire C's, you know. Because <laughs> B's don't want people smarter than them. A's aren't afraid of them. That was what we said. And I t we took that, that advice, and I, when we did the business, we got to the point where we hired everybody. There was nobody was hired. Now, we, were, we never got to the size that Creo got to, but even at Creo, you were many hundreds of people, and you were still involved with the hiring process. Yeah, yeah. And the people, they didn't get hired unless you spent at least a day there. Yeah. We, drove, we tested people. Imagine, it was a shock to me how many people have a degree or a diploma and don't have a clue. So, uh, I mean, Dan taught me that. We need to hire a mechanical engineer, so Dan told the guy to bring over a drawing or something he, he, uh, he had designed. So a guy comes over, and we're talking to him. And Dan looks at this drawing and says, um, Dan figured out right away that this part couldn't be made, okay, to the tolerance. So he asked the guy, well, how do you make, you know, how do you make this, and how do you make that hole to that tolerance? And he said, you use a boring, boring bar, blah, blah, blah. And Dan says, well, no, they're, they're not that accurate. So Dan drove him crazy to the point he said, my job is to design it. It's production's job to figure out how to make it. <laughs> but it couldn't be made. And this is a, an engineer designing. So, I mean, we were into real precision, into Micron. And, and, so we had to train everybody, but. Yeah, and so I, you know, I, can't, I can't explain the importance of if you're ever running a business is you get involved with hiring the people because ultimately you're looking for the best. And if you're the running the, the company, you don't care about ego. You're looking for the, the very best talent. And you know, if you look at Creo, one of the things you, you, know, you asked, some people commented about it being a great place to work. And I know a lot of people who've worked at Creo. And they, they loved the place and they worked hard. But I mean, what was your, you know, how many people left Creo? How many people quit the company? Nobody quit in the first 10 years. We, well, some left because we, uh, we let them go. No, I should, to be more accurate, it's, it's pretty close. Nobody left to go to another high tech. One left, kind of burnt out and started the bed and breakfast. <laughs> one died. <laughs> uh, there was a third one. And then after 10 years, this woman in production quit and went back to MDI where she'd come from. And Dan was aghast. I thought, this is life. And he went and talked to her, and she said, well, they offered me a bit more money. And he showed her that with profit sharing, she was actually taking a cut, because we had profit sharing. But anyway, she came back three months later. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so nobody quit. And at Creo, you gave equity to, the, to employees. Yeah. Every, yeah, shares, not options, too. I'm a big believer in shares are better than options, but that's a whole other discussion. 
But there's tax implications now. No, yeah, yeah there's, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> there's motivation, uh, there's motivation implications. If a person feels like they own the company if they own a share. They don't feel that way if they own an option. So if you're going to let people sign purchase orders, et cetera, you're going to feel like owners. That was my philosophy. And we held to that. Like it, people are going back to shares. So. Yeah. At, at Datum, we, we, we never lost a single person for the first four or five years. So this the same kind of mantra that Ken had. And I, it's one of the things that I, I look at now when you talk to companies is if, if there's attrition and people are leaving and quitting, it's, 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 not, it's, a, it's a bad sign. It, you know, there's a sign that there's displeasure. And I realize that you know, the generation's changing now and people are always looking for better opportunities. But you want a company. If you're going to invest in a business, you want a business which maintains their best employees. And you want a business that doesn't fire too many people because ultimately they've hired the best employees. That, that they, make those, they make those decisions. So before we get into question and answer, Ken, I know looking at the time, you know, you've, you've now kind of morphed your, as you go to different seasons in life into more of a philanthropist. Fourth career. Your right. fourth career, into a bit of a philanthropist. And I, I you know, well, I'll, yeah, it, it, it's, a staggering, it's a staggering how much, how much Ken uh, gives um, of his, not only of his money, but of his time. But, you know, specifically, um, it's given an inordinate amount of money to, um, you know, to SFU and to UBC, uh, both where he is an alum. Um, and, you know, Science World, if you've ever been down to Science World, there's a big park. It's called the Ken Spencer Park and Pavilion, things like that, uh, funding that. And then there's a, 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 a overseas projects. I know in, in Guatemala, you're doing a, a place with an orphanage and you're setting things up with a, you know, telecommunications grid and things like that. So, you know, what, what, what drives you now? Just, in, I know in your, your sawning, your... your what drives me now? Yeah, no, as far, as far as giving, like what's the... What, oh. I don't know, because you know, I get I quite often get asked by people donating to you know what makes you want to give your money away. You know, once we sold Creo, I had more money than I needed, more money than I wanted to give my kids. So I thought, what am I going to do with this? Should I invest it in high tech where I made my money, or should I give it to charity? And I decided, well, I'll invest it in high tech, and I'll give the profits from that to charity. But the high tech has taken too long. <laughs> So skip that step. And uh, I don't know. It's always been part of me just to want to help people. So, you know, right now we, so education is one. We believe in education. Uh, we have three pillars, as I call them. The second one's harder to put a word on, but it's helping people get up a level in their life. So it's not sustaining them where they are, but so sponsoring a lot of kids homeless kids going back to schools and getting jobs and getting skills and so on. And the third one's environment, which my wife uh, is keen on and she, she does most of that. So, I don't know, it's, it's hard to answer why. Because I didn't come from a family that, um, that, that made donations at all. Um, but they were socialists and they believed the government should do it all, so. I mean, they cared about people. But uh, they, uh, so I didn't come from a culture like that. But it's lots of fun, lots of work. People don't realize how hard it is to give money away responsibly, responsibly being the key. Because you can take a charity, especially in the downtown east side where we do a lot of work, if you give a, a good charity money at the wrong time, you can, you can ruin it. If you give the wrong charity money, you can ruin a few people's lives. And, yeah. So you have to do a lot of work. <laughs> well, where I invest in education to start with isn't necessarily a problem. Well, um, as evidenced by here, my, my sweet spot is um, getting business students and engineering students together while they're still at school rather than waiting for them to start fighting at work. <laughs> And uh, so we, you know, we have the, the center here and the program here. There's a similar but quite different program at UBC I sponsor, New Ventures Design, which is a class consists of half business students, half engineering students. They have to develop a product. They have to apply for a patent or have some pretty strong IP. So um, that's what I focus on. I mean, in a Creo, we were a bit different, like a product manager is usually a marketing position, 
but in Creo, the product managers also had the project managers doing the development report to them. So they were responsible for the product and the marketing, one person. Because in too many companies, they, you know, you hear the expression, I'm sure, they, you know, engineering develops a product and throws it over the wall to production, and then they throw it over the wall to marketing. <laughs> they have to go out and sell it. So, so that's what we focus on. Uh, problems in education that could go on all day. <laughs> Whoa. You answer that one. <laughs> For the real world. No, well, uh, I think Laurie should answer it too. Uh, I'm a big believer that you shouldn't, that you should be teaching the education should be the fundamentals, like I'm high on math and physics, because the technology changes through your life immensely. But if you understand the math and physics, you know, you can, you can adapt to those changes. If you only learn how to code in one language, you know, well, maybe you can go to another language, but, um, but you, I'm really high, and, and I know students don't like to hear that because they want to do the latest, greatest thing and work in the latest, greatest stuff, but I'm really high on the, on the fundamentals because it'll last you your life. Just to add to that, I would say that, uh, um, I, I, we talked about briefly, but it's just ensuring that you understand the, um, the financial aspects, understanding the soft skills. I still say that a CEO needs to be your best salesperson because you're gonna go quite a num long time before you're ever gonna hire a VP of sales. So if you're not that salesperson, so, and it's the same thing as in, if you're a CTO, and that everybody likes the C title, you want to be the CTO. If you're, you, you can't stand up in front of a customer and whiteboard on a wall and look someone in the eye and express ideas and, and formulate those things, you're not a CTO. A CTO has got to be a dynamic sales individual. So I think there's the soft skills, and I'm adding to Ken's comment, I agree completely with Ken, but those soft skills are very, very important, those personal skills, your ability to communicate effectively. I and mean, if you're not a great communicator, you can be tremendously valuable in the company, but you're not the CEO or the CTO. You might be the great VP engineering, but the CTO needs to be a dynamic, technically minded individual. And if you meet, you know, Ken's CTO or my CTO, you know, they are as dynamic as you'd ever. They're quirky. Um, they're very quirky. <laughs> I was but they're say off the wall, yeah, they're quirky. Yeah. <laughs> but they're they're incredibly dynamic individuals who are, are likable and are, are tremendously. You can put them in front of anyone, and they they light up the world and they talk about where things are going. So for the business, it's, it's like competitive advantage. Uh, Dan, my partner, even though, uh, for, uh, had a, he got a degree in electrical engineering, but he'd had, because that's what his friends were doing, but he had had a lifelong interest since he was 12 in mechanical. And then at MDA, we needed some optics, and we didn't have any optics engineers, so he got out the, bur excuse me, got out books and learned optics. So he could design mechanical, electrical, and optics. Um, and where other people had to have committees, he uh, could make those trade-offs in his, in his head. As well as he's a huge inventor. I always say he can walk across the street and invent a new curb. He's always got original ideas. So, so we wanted something that, you know, where we could we use all those skills. Because we could beat other companies. So, and the optical tape recorder used them all for sure. It wasn't too bad because the optical tape recorder we sold to governments, and the government is a particular sale. Um, slow, but steady wins the race. <laughs> um, when it came to, um, to the uh, plate maker, computer to plate, uh, maybe we got lucky, but R. R. Donnelly and Sons, the largest printer in the world, decided that they were going to be the first to have computer to plate. And I don't know why. It was an ego thing because when you read a book, you don't care if it's made on computer to plate or not, right? But anyways, they decided and they started going around the world uh, visiting companies and uh, that they thought could do it. And they heard about us and we, we were doing some stuff I didn't get into in that time making image film recorders. And they came to see us, and eventually we negotiated a contract uh, where they gave us $12 million, a $12 million contract for 20 machines uh, before we even started the R&D with progress payments. 
So they funded the company into that business. Uh, and we didn't want to be a one customer company. So we actually had it, you know, they couldn't take all the production. We, they only could take a certain percentage, which they didn't like. But we didn't want to be able to just fulfill all of those orders and not have any other customers. So once they got going and had computer to plate, then you know other companies. So it it wasn't too challenging at that level. Eventually, of course, the competitors catch up, and um, and the, the 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 reason eventually that we sold the company was that we did make a strategic error if you want to get into that. <laughs> um, so we made plate makers. And it's like the razor and the razor blade. And our competition, all of them, made plate makers and plates. So they would go to a printer, especially a smaller printer, and say, if you sign a five-year contract for you know, plates, we'll give you the plate maker. So it was really tough for us to compete. Uh, and we tried to do a deal with Kodak because they made plates and no plate maker. They were the only one. But I don't know if Kodak was just, you know, waiting, waiting us out to buy us or whatever. But so then we got into the plate business, and we bought a plate, two plate companies, and we did everything. One in South Africa, but it was it was it was a bit too late, and uh, we we weren't making a profit because we our the cost of our plate maker was 25% less than our competitors. Um, but, so, if they, and that's just because we were more efficient and smarter, but, so they sold theirs at cost, which means we could only sell at cost plus 25%, and you can't sustain a business with 25% margin. So our margin started getting squeezed. And, Well, most companies don't fail because of the technology. They usually get it eventually. They fail because there's either A, no marketing, no market, sorry, or they don't know how to market, or they completely ignored the competition. You know, you bring up competition, oh, those guys don't know what they're doing. Well, sometimes they do. So I'm just trying to think of the spectacular failures. Um, it was mostly a, a lack of market, actually. There wasn't enough people wanted to buy it. Go ahead, Ben. Ah, well, first of all, it wasn't so expensive when we started Creo. Uh, <laughs> secondly, neither of us had mortgages, and thirdly, neither of us, had, both of us, actually had cash in the bank that we'd saved up. And what if you don't? <laughs> Anyways, like what if you have so, no cash in the bank? I hadn't quite finished. But remember, we started a consulting company, which, which was profitable from day one. So the first three months, we didn't take any money out, maybe a little longer. And then the next year, we took a half salary. So, but, so the, we generated money right away. So that doesn't work. I mean, you know, that's a bit harder now, maybe. But we bootstrapped it. It is, yeah, it is expensive now, but it wasn't then. Well, the later stage funding was, you know, the, f we, we, the first round of financing was done by uh, what's now called BDC, a local venture. Next stage, for whatever reason, partly because of Vamos' contacts, all came from, um, from, came from the Netherlands, actually. I'm not sure why. Then some from Israel, and then Goldman Sachs invested in our company and an equity fund in Chicago. So, but you know we were really growing at that stage. We needed we needed the money for working capital to expand, to grow the business at 50 to 100 percent per year. The, um, the 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 people side at that time, and I'm a bit out of touch. There was you know one of my jobs was to make Creo look really good, uh, so people wanted to work there. And at that time, there was always one company. That people really wanted to work for. And when I went to MDA, well, it was after that. I went to MDA, it was only seven people. But at one point, MDA, everybody wanted to work there. And 
I just made sure, and I'm, one of our technicians went to a party, and the guy says, oh, where do you work? And he said, oh, I work at Korea. He said, oh, I really want to work there. I don't have a clue what you do, but I want to work there. So we, you know, I gave interviews and made it sound really good and didn't mention the 80-hour weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so everybody wanted to work for us. And, and actually, so I, most of our engineers, until we got into the mechanical, except for mechanical, came from Simon Fraser. And that's because I, and that was part of what I did. Uh, when we were starting the company, I, I, I ran a project management course for, for the engineering undergrads. I ran the project management course. And I did not, not to make money, but to spot the good engineers. <laughs> and so we hired them, and then they started hiring, you know. So we ended up, not by design, but hiring mostly Simon Fraser, but they didn't have mechanical, so, and, uh, so when we got more into mechan needed mechanical people, they ended up coming from UBC. But, but we worked really hard at finding good people, for sure. Yeah. Well, I think the founders should just split it equally. Otherwise, you're just going to argue forever. Um, so I, I originally, but then you have a shareholders agreement usually. That, you know. If somebody leaves, you can buy them out, and so on and so forth. We had decided very early that we were going to allocate a lot of shares, 25% to the employees, which was unheard of in those days. Um, but that's just the way Dan and I wanted to do it. We thought, we'll keep enough for ourselves, and why not? if we're going to have more than that, why not give them to the employees? Oh. Yeah, good question because we had a probation period. It was originally three. We made it six months because somebody could fool you for three months. Um, <laughs> and then we were, I was really tough. And the project, I'd go to the project manager. He says, ah, you know, he's not, he's, he's not great, but he's not so bad. And, if, you know, if we let him go at the end of the probation period, you know, then I'll have to find somebody else and I'll delay it. And I say, look, just make the decision that you're going to work with this person for 10 more years. And I really pushed them to be brutal <laughs> um, in their decision. Because after six months, if, if they weren't producing to the level then, that you wanted, then make the change then because you had the probation period. You can do it a lot easier. And, and um, yeah. And there was a lot of people, you know, that was just in the wrong job. I've, so, you know, we'd move and we'd help try and help them find another job. And I've had people come back and thank me for firing them. Because if they're not performing, they usually know it, consciously or subconsciously. So you get them a job that suits their talents. Uh, but we, uh, as we got bigger, you know, I said, spend easily a day there interviewing. And anybody that interviewed them could say no. And it's a type one, type two. And if one person said no, we didn't hire them. And it's a type one, type two error for those people who know what that is. It's, it's much more costly to hire the wrong person than not to hire a good person because you can always find another good person. Cheaper than hiring the wrong person. Um, my question is, what would you say is the key driver to growth? in your company? How are you able to grow the company so quickly? And what's the key driver? Well, OK, so you got to have the money <laughs> for working capital. And, you got, and, and the growth is usually limited by how fast you can, assuming the market's there, OK? Uh, either how fast you can sell it or how fast you can hire and train good people. Because you're all going flat out. Hiring, is, as I mentioned, is a lot of work. So hiring and training good people is usually the, the key if the market's there, is the thing that limits your growth. And, you know, if you grow too fast, you can start making mistakes. So. You notice, I notice in a lot of high, certainly at MDA and Creo both, you'd grow like 100% for two years, and this wasn't by design, and then you'd kind of go flat for a year, and I think it was just like a catch-up. Let's figure out what we're doing. You've got to have different systems, you know, different everything. So when you double your company. 
Oh, I, I think it's really important. Amos, who took over as CEO from me, said he, he, he considered it one of the com competitive advantages of our company over other companies because people worked hard. We could get products to market faster and, uh, and they were better. And that was due to the culture of letting people work, do it, you know, the person closest to the work, if they're a good person, can do it much better than, than a manager kind of watching, telling them what to do. So, so the culture is extremely important. Now, lots of successful companies with different cultures, you know, so it, it's, you, you got to go with what you know, you know, like Apple who had terrible cult, culture as far as human relations go, <laughs> most successful company. So it, it's not for everybody. And that culture isn't for everybody. At one point, um, we were having an exercise in how we should make decisions. And uh, that's a long story. But anyway, I went through an exercise. Should we use consensus, you know, whatever, whatever. And one guy, and, and we broke into groups, and they met, and they were supposed to come back with the answer. I set it up. And one guy stormed out of one of these sessions saying, it's Ken's job to make decisions and my job to do what I'm told. And, and you know, he, he left. It wasn't the culture he was happy with. He was an older guy. Actually, he quit. Did I say nobody quit? <laughs> I forgot about him. Well, I'll, I'll start off. The, the first, my first business, you know, we didn't have any downtimes. We... we we just had a, we were on a good trajectory. If you understand it, this was a company that started in '95 and sold in 2000, and so the things were just rocking and moving forward on that. So it was a, it was an accelerated pace. Uh, a company I was running, uh, um, Partnerpedia, and we just sold it uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and I, I I didn't start the company. I kind of assumed the role. I started out as the chair, and then became the executive chair, and then ran the business until it's selling. Um, and we had a number of downtimes. So I didn't start the company, but. Um, we just had to constantly manage the financials. That was the one thing. Unfortunately, that was a company where I, I think there were some flaws in, in hiring, and uh, weren't always the best people were always hired. Um, but we had to let people go. But we were always ahead of the game, and so it was just managing cash flow. That was the you know we never let things get to two point. It, it, at some point, when you think you need to let someone go, you've already probably should have let them go a week or two weeks earlier. And we had to just manage that. And that was unfortunate. I, that was probably one of the most, most difficult times I've had to deal with, <clears throat> where we had to let you know, people go. And ultimately, the company was successful, but there were times where there were dips. And you have to manage cash. And you got, we had a line of credit with our bank, and we were getting to the end of that exposure. So you always had to, you always had to kind of gun to your head and kind of stay below that level. And I hated it. I, I was the worst part about it at all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely horrible at, at firing people or letting people go because I... I don't know what to say, and, and, and I probably care too much, but. Yeah, we never laid anybody off. There was a period when we weren't selling as many optical tape recorders as we um, built up to do, so we had people with idle capacity, but it was only a few months, so we gave them odd jobs. But if I can just add one little comment on more of a personal level, I, I, I always contend that, um, you know, in my case, I was married, and it's still, it's still am married, but it, 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 you know, having a supportive spouse is, is, or a partner, whoever, is, is incredibly valuable if, that, if you are in that situation because you, you, knew, you do neglect them and uh, you just don't spend the time with them. And I had a young family at early on, now they're a little bit older, but you don't spend as much time with them. So you, you, you end up wanting to spend time with your children and you therefore, you, you, by nature of the hours, you neglect your, your spouse. But hopefully they, they can deal with that and, and uh, without there being problems. Home and bath the kids and put them in the bed and go back to work. Yeah, that was that was the <laughs> thing. In our case, we were getting uh, we we were getting knowledge, technical knowledge, because we were, we were doing the optical tape recorder, and the company that we were quote consulting to, we were making them specialized machines for production of optical cards. So at, and no, and it was a perfect marriage because. Nobody else would make their machines for them, and and nobody else would. Um, so they had no choice to come to us, and nobody else would give us the kind of money that we charged them. Uh, so so it was actually in our case it helped us technically, 
I don't know about. Well, in, in our case, we, we, we started the company. It was kind of birthed out of angst because the company we were part of was selling a division and we didn't want to be part of that. So we thought we'd start our own business, but we didn't have an idea. So it was, you know, instead of forcing into an idea, we thought, well, let's do what we do know how to do, and that's consult. Build up a business, and it did happen to pay for the way it helped to help mature us as well. And then we went and looked at a market. I think the one thing we recognized, you know, I was a real strong believer that the market was the most important thing, and you had to look at for a growing market. And we just hadn't done the diligence on that. It takes a long time. So we spent, you know, you know, a significant amount of months talking to customers and talking to where opportunities would be to find that. Instead of forcing it, we took our time to doing that. But, and it turned out to be the, a right decision.